is Pam Snow, if you do not know me, and um, I'm the person that had the absolute privilege and honor and blast to get to teach the Bible lesson every single day. And so we had a great week, as you can see. Um, but what I want to just share with you today is a, is a quick testimony of something that um, God used the very first day that we had campers um, to remind me, as Brian had said, this was our seventh year. And God really used this encounter, and it's not one that you would typically think would necessarily be as encouraging as it was. But to just show me he is at work, um, that his Holy Spirit is doing things behind the scenes even when we don't see it. Um, and, and so it was a pretty incredible. So it was the first day of camp. Um, lesson part was done. Sports part was done. We were at the very end in our wrap-up time where um, you can see them up there singing. Um, and so praise and worship was going on. And I had a young man out of the Air Force. And the Air Force are eight- and nine-year-old group. And so he came and he found me while music's going on. And he said, can I tell you something? And I'm like, well, sure. And he says, I came here to play sports, not go to church. And so I said, well, here, let's look at our shirts. And so we got our shirts, and I said, you see how it says vacation, Bible, sports camp. We're actually here to do both. And he says, oh. And off he walks back up to where he was standing. <laughs> So very shortly after, again, music is still going, here he comes back, and he has another question. He's like, um, his question was, are all the songs that we're going to be singing going to be God and Jesus songs? And I said, yes, they are, because he is the reason that we're here, and we couldn't do any of this without him. And he said, oh, and off he went. <laughs> Eight or nine years old, that was our last personal encounter of the week. Now, I actually left that conversation pumped because it was that reminder, something was going on in that young man's heart. And, you know, he came with an expectation of what he was going to get to do, which was play sports. But see, what I knew that he didn't know is he was a living testimony of what the whole week's lessons were going to be about because it was people who came to the Lord um, with an expectation to be healed. Um, lots of, we, we talked about God's miracles. And so they came to him with this expectation, but in the end, they actually, all of them got something very different. And they were confronted with a question in each one of our lessons. And it was always about, what do you believe about me? It was so much more um, than just the miracle. And so to me, that was the encouragement that even though we don't always get to see it, we don't know what's going on in the hearts, and it doesn't matter whether they're 7 or 12, the Holy Spirit is doing his job. And he has given our church the most incredible open door to bring kids in, let them have the blast that you saw, and then give them the gospel to confront them with what do I believe about Jesus? And so as I thank the first um, group, thank, er, first service, thank you guys for your support um, of VBSC. God is working. Please, please keep praying for the kids um, who were here because seeds are sown, songs are stuck in their head, and God is working and he wants to continue to work. Hello, um, I'm Gabe Lutz. I got the privilege of working with the Air Force. Uh, that was eight and nine year olds. Um, I've gotten to work with them um, for the majority of the time that we've done VBSC. Um, and it's just been uh, an honor to get to serve um, with this church uh, in doing this. It's a tremendous ministry um, and it's something that is so important, just spreading God's love into the community and into the hearts and the lives of these uh, young kids that come uh, onto our property. Um, so everybody who has been a part of it, uh, thank you. Uh, any who have uh, debated whether being a part of it, um, give in to the debate and uh, go with God and join up. Um, and uh, if you're not sure you can, uh, I, I encourage you to try and find the, uh, 
find the time or make the time to uh, be a part of it or um, other parts of our church ministry because it's so important. Um, but our, our uh, theme this year, Believe It, John three sixteen, uh, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Uh, but we also included in our song, uh, verse 17, for God sent not a son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Um, emphasis there on the world might be saved. Um, when thinking about what I was going to talk about coming up here, I thought about, you know, this verse and our, our theme and um, how many times I meet people and it crosses my mind oh, they'll never accept Christ. They're too far gone in their sin. They're, too, they're living in it too openly or, wh or whatever. But God's intent and purpose is that the world might be saved um, through Jesus' sacrifice. Uh, and I know, I, you know, I'm generally, I think those thoughts, you know, kind of about um, older people who have been uh, living in sin for a while, you know, but, uh, and, don't really have those thoughts about these children, but we, we still see, you know, um, you know, Pam talked about that kid who came up to her and was like, I'm not here for God, I came here for sports. Um, and just that, that bit of um, rebellion already seen in their lives as well. Um, you know, we had a, a kid in our group uh, who was in our group last year as well. And last year, man, he was a struggle. Um, he was just hard to get along with other people, uh, easily became a disruption at times. Uh, and this year just saw a change. Like he was much more calm. He was much more uh, relaxed. Um, and the fact that he even came again was, uh, you know, really encouraging and tremendous, but just the constant uh, or the repeated um, exposure to God's word and the impact and power that that can have on people's lives. Uh, even those that you think are, oh, this is, they're too challenging or they'll never accept God or they'll never accept Christ. Um, and we've got to keep going out there and giving that message um, because it's ultimately, it's God that tears down those walls, that tears down those defenses um, it's not what we do. We just got to keep uh, putting ourselves in that position to serve. Uh, so I just encur continue to encourage you. Um, make that time. Find that time. Uh, and, and serve wherever you can. Hi, I'm Courtney Lutz, and um, I've had the pleasure of serving in BBSC um, every year with my husband and, and so many of my friends. And as I was meditating on what I would share today, this one specific um, kid kept coming to my mind. I was just like, Lord, what about our interactions am I supposed to share with you um, this morning? And it really comes back to something I was already meditating on that week as I had just started reading in Job, and I was meditating on his, Job's friends' responses, and my prayers were, Lord, I don't want to respond with inappropriate truth. I w Lord, give me the words to say to these students that apply to them, but it's also full of compassion, because uh, I'm not going to know their situations, just like Job's friends didn't know the real truth behind his situation. And so I didn't want to respond with a truth that was hurtful or harmful. Um, and this one student Bless her heart, she was the whole week, I'm bad at this, I, why did I even come? I shouldn't even be here, I'm not good at sports, why am I here? And throughout the week, it was, I'm glad you're here. I am so glad we get to spend time with you. Please keep coming, you know, you're valuable, you're important, God has a plan for you beyond sports. You don't have to be good at sports to do them, <laughs> you know? I'm not good at sports, I do them. And I was really just drawn to the fact that what drew me to God in the first place with, was his people's compassion towards me and how much that they loved me when I came as a kind of a rotten teenager. Um, 
but just needed to hear that they wanted me to be there, that they enjoyed my company, that I was their friend, and, and I didn't have to change, even though God does change me and continues to change me, but that that wasn't a requirement for me to come and to participate and to have an enjoyable time. And so really I was just left with compassion. Just like Paul says, I don't want to be a tinkling brass. I want to be so full of compassion that they then want to hear the truth of the gospel. Um, and so that's just really what I wanted to share is that I don't come and participate in BBSC sports camp because I love sports but because I want to show the compassion that Jesus showed towards me through his people, and I want to be a part of that mission. So thank you again for listening to my testimony. Good morning. Um, this was my first year helping with the kids. And it was a real blessing. The year before I helped, but I was in a, a different uh, part of the camp. But uh, you see what this says. It says, believe it. Well, I believe it. And I believe he was with us every day. I could feel him in the mornings when we'd meet early. Uh, the team would meet early and we would get into God's word. We would pray. We would talk and share the day with, about each other. I felt him. I felt his encouragement. I felt his love to be able to go and minister to those kiddos that we were going to see that day. I saw him working among us. I had a wonderful, the team that I was on, the Army, the five-year-olds. Now, I've got some stories to tell you, five-year-olds. <laughs> But being my first year uh, helping with the kids, they were so encouraging to me. And um, I was up at the table, and the kids were sitting around, and we were getting ready to teach the Bible verse. Well, if you can imagine, five-year-olds, their attention span cannot be very good at times. So I'm like, okay, kids. And Andrew Brogan, bless his heart, he saw what was happening and he stepped up to the plate and it was like I was never there they were just like oh Andrew I love you <laughs> oh, man. He, he was he, he saved the day but then there is where I saw him the Lord working working among us lifting each other up another situation we had a, a little girl she came with her two older brothers and Boy, they shot off to wherever they needed to go. Well, the little girl was her first time, and she was going to be in our group. She was five years old. So she was crying and sobbing, and, Mom, I don't want to stay. I want to go home. I don't want to stay. Well, Debbie Kemper and Liz Mendez, they took that little girl under their, their wings, and we all loved, loved on her and showed her, hey, you're going to have a great time. It's going to be fun. Well, the tears kind of subsided a little bit, and we got a few little smiles. The next day, the mother goes, she was in such a hurry, she thought she was going to be late. <laughs> <laughs> so that was so comforting and warming to our hearts. But the last day, we're handing out their little goodies, we're getting ready to go to praise and worship, and that little girl looked up and said, I'm sure going to miss you guys. And those were the sweetest words you could hear. I also felt him in praise and worship. When we're out there singing praises to his name. And the kids, the excitement on their faces, the love and joy that you could see. You couldn't, you just, there's no replacing it. So I can't wait to see what he has for me for next year, for all of us. And if you have the opportunity, go for it. So thank you for allowing me to share that with you. It was a real blessing. We had a great week.
Good morning. Uh, I'm Tony Pittman. I've, I've been coming here for close to 20 years now with my family. And I was able to help out last year on my days off, so I helped out just two days. And uh, when it come up this year, I uh, was really kind of looking forward to helping, at least for the, the few days off. And so I want to I wanna share three different things that God showed me in this particular week. Uh, we had uh, one of the little kids we had on the first day, she was very set aside. She wasn't, uh, she didn't make, have a lot of friends. She wasn't around a lot of, a lot of the kids. And uh, she just kind of kept to herself pretty much the whole first day. And after the, all the lessons and we come in the next day and Isabel was my helper in my group. She pointed out the next day how God was moving the rest of the kids and pulled her with them and sat with her, had lunch with her and wanted to do things with her to help include her in the group and it was just just amazing uh, watching that. Uh, the second thing that I want to share was just watching the high schoolers that was there, how, uh, how much of a blessing it was seeing their love for these kids and their passion and their excitement and their energy just flowing through these kids and that got me to showing that got to showing me the third thing that I want to share when I was contemplating helping my wife was asking me about uh taking vacation for the week to help. So I ended up doing that. But God showed me this verse earlier this week when I was trying to figure out what I wanted to share. And it's uh, Revelation 3.16. So then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. See, over the last, I don't know, last several years uh, with my work and my schedule, I've taken a step back and haven't been involved. I used to be involved in every ministry we had, VBSC, or not VBSC, but uh, Happy Five, Mighty Mites. I was involved every time. I had a, half my closet was, <laughs> was ADP shirts and hats, you know. And this particular week, God showed me that I had stepped back and I needed to get back involved. And, uh, I just want to say that if you guys have vacation that you don't use or just a couple extra days that you don't have, you really should get involved. It's just such a blessing and an honor. And uh, it's not too late. If you stepped away and you have taken a step back in your relationship, it's not too late to get back on track. So, thank you.
morning, everybody. That was amazing, wasn't it? I mean, just listening to how God was working in everybody's lives in BVSC. Um, I hope you all um, have captured the heart of every individual that got up here because they all spoke from the heart and what God did um, and what God is doing, and it's continual. Um, my name is Brian Calloway. I'm an assistant pastor here at, at First Bible, plus also uh, the regional mission director. And that's just VBSC, Vacation Bible Sports Camp, is just one piece of our regional missions. Um, there's, there's many more. We even have a, a golf tournament coming up here that you can still get involved in, okay? Um, that is actually helping out uh, uh, Plaza Heights Christian Academy. So we are in our, involved in our community making a difference, right? And that's exactly what God has called us to do. And so you got to hear the hearts of people who've been involved for many years. And this VBSC that we had, believe it, was our seventh one. It was our seventh VBSC. And um, it's an honor to be a part of that. And there's many more testimonies that people could get up here and share. I'll just share one, but it's, it's through uh, Mindy Patterson. She was telling me she was talking to a mom out here. There's a lot of conversations that take place out here. And um, I even, I remember when, when, we, I, I, when we first started VBSC, we had to go out and hand out flyers in and, and, and different ways to get the, the uh, uh, com, um, community awareness. We don't have to do that now because so many people are aware of what's happening. And uh, Mindy was sharing with me that uh, she was talking to a mom, and the mom was very sincere when she said, you as a church probably don't realize the impact that you're making on your community. And she had shared that her and some other moms and their kids, um, they have a Facebook page that they all meet with, and, or they meet together. And what they'll do is they'll go to different parks around town just to spend time together. I think they've met online, or I don't know exactly how they met. But she said, this was before VBSC, that when they had met at one of the parks, that's all the kids were talking about was looking forward to our Vacation Bible Sports Camp. And even the parents were talking about it. And I share that because that's the type of impact that a ministry like this makes. And it didn't happen overnight. This took a vision that God has given to our pastor and through the body of Christ have allowed it to come to pass. And we'll never know this side of eternity how many people have been reached through this. And, and I'm already looking forward to next year. In my uh, VBSC folder, I have on my computer, I have another folder that says 2025 with a question mark, you know? So we're already looking ahead of what God's going to do. And as, as long as God would allow us to be a part of this special ministry and many more, we're going to continue to move forward. And that's what this message is about today. It's about furtherance of the gospel, continuing. And it's an extension to the body of Christ. For those of you who have been involved, keep going. For those of you that haven't been able to be a part of it, you have an opportunity too. I know that not everybody can do everything, and I get that. But if God is nudging your heart to do something, do it. Move forward with it. There's plenty of people around here with experience that can walk you through this to help you understand. And it's not as intimidating as you might think it is with all these kids, all right? It's a lot of kids. But man, it's uh, a lot of them, they're, they're more seasoned than we are. They've been around there for seven years. They know exactly what to expect. So, you know, I'm praying that today's message will really challenge you guys in a way to help you see your community through the eyes of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So go ahead and turn to, um, you can move over to Psalm 27 and then also John chapter 4. And while you're doing that, I'm just going to read this verse that's up on the screen. I don't have it word for word. I just had the address. It's Philippians 1.12. It says, But I would, have you to under, um, I would have you should understand, brethren, that the things which happen unto me have fallen out rather unto the furtherance of the gospel. This is Paul the Apostle speaking unto um, the church of Philippi, and he's saying, you know, there are some bad things that's happened to him. And he's helping them to understand that what it is that I have faced, it's okay. Don't fret about it because it's for the furtherance of the gospel. And so one thing we learn from this verse is that if you're going to further the gospel, it's going to cost you something. It's going gonna, it's gonna to cost you much. 
Um, and I heard our pastor say this, which is true. Jesus always asked for more. He never asked for less. He's never going to ask less of you. He's always going to ask more of you because the kingdom that he's building, this is an important, this is kind of a big deal, right? I mean, there's people's souls at stake that if they don't enter into this kingdom, they're going to be separated from God for all of eternity. So yeah, it's kind of a big deal. And so if you look at what we give up compared to eternity, it's nothing. And so we live in a, in a blessed nation right now, I would say. It's a messed up nation, but it's a blessed nation. And so we have a lot of opportunities to be involved. And yes, we're going to sacrifice, but that's exactly what Paul is saying. He's saying, I've given up a lot, but it's for the furtherance. It's worth it. And so what we're looking at right now is we're going to see in the Old Testament something that the more things change, the more they are the same, right? I mean, really, there's nothing new under the sun. And what we see in Psalm 27 is actually, or I'm sorry, Psalm 72. Don't want you to flip over to 27. I hope I didn't say 27 at first. Did I say 27? Okay, flip those numbers, right? Go to Psalm 72, my bad. Just flip those, right? Psalm 72, I apologize about that. But the last verse says, the prayers of David, the son of Jesse, are ended. This is the last known pa uh, passage from for a prayer that, that, that David has written, okay? And, and, and my question is, if you're going to write a letter unto the Lord, if you're going to write a, a letter to your son or to your child, what would it be about if it was your last one? What would you write about to them? Would it be connected to something that's temporal in this world, like I hope you make it, I hope the college tuition will get it paid off, but I hope this job works well for you? Is that what it's going to be about? Not that that's not important. Or is it going to be more connected to something that is... God-oriented? Is it eternal? And see, what we're looking at right here, it is. When we look at the Old Testament, a lot of it is history. You're looking at something physical that's taking place, but it's always pointing to the future for a spiritual truth for us, something to learn, right? And so what we see in this passage right now is that David is writing a final letter to the Lord, and it's about Solomon. See, there's a transition taking place. He's transitioning from David to his son, from a king to his son to be involved in his community. Doesn't use the word community, but he's saying the nation of Israel is what he's talking about. And so the definition of community is this. It's a, a group of people living in the same place or having a particular characteristic in common. Well, that can be a nation, that can be your community if you're identifying nationally, but obviously we, could, we identify that as where we live, right? Blue Springs, KC, wherever it might be. And so right now you have a man writing a letter unto the Lord and, and it's directed towards the Lord about his son. And here's what he's saying. L let's read the first few verses. It says, Give the king thy judgments, O God, and thy righteousness unto the king's son. And he shall judge thy people with righteousness and thy poor with judgment. The mountains shall bring peace to the people, the little hills by righteousness. He shall judge the poor of the people. He shall save the children of the needy, and he shall break in pieces the oppressor, right? Now look, jump over to 12, uh, verses 12 through 14. For he shall deliver the needy when he crieth, the poor also, and him that hath no helper. He shall spare the poor, the needy. He shall save the souls of the needy. He shall redeem their souls from deceit and violence. The precious shall hear the blood or hear, uh, shall hear their blood in his sight. And so he's saying right here, this is my prayer for him. This is what I'm wanting. He's saying he's going to deliver. He wants him to deliver the needy, to deliver the poor, to redeem their soul from deceit and violence. And again, he's speaking right now specifically about the nation of Israel. But again, you have a king writing to, about, to the Lord about his son, about a people group. And I hope you're kind of connecting that right now. Because what we're going to see over in John chapter 4 is really the same thing. You have a king talking about a, a community, and he's writing it directly about a, his, his children, the children of God, to do something, to be involved, okay? And so in order to further the gospel, we have first got to see the need, and then we have to respond. And what we see over here in Psalm is really the exact same thing that we're going to see throughout all of Scripture that there is a need, people have a need. So there's a need for reach our community. 
and it's deliver the needy. It's to deliver the poor. It's to, rede- um, to redeem the soul from the deceit and violence. And he's in David here, though, he understands something. And I think we can grasp it, too. Look at verse 18. He said, Blessed be the Lord God, the God of Israel, who only doeth wondrous things. See, he's recognizing This is where my son's moving into. This is what he's getting ready to face. He's getting ready to engage in a difficult situation. And there's a lot of broken people. And he's going to be overseeing this. But one thing we recognize, you're the one who's going to accomplish this. You're the only ones that can do this wonderful work. You see, David recognizes this. If my son Solomon is going to be, if if he's going to have success, it's only going to be through you, God. And we understand that man fell, uh, that people fell. I mean, David fell. We understand Solomon fell. We're all going to fail at some time. But at this moment right now, David has a prayer for his son. So our job is the same as Solomon's. Only today, it's not about a physical nation. It's about a spiritual kingdom. That is where we've inserted ourselves. And we are to be active in the midst of our community with the message that delivers the poor and the needy and soul from deceit and violence. This is what we've been entrusted with. This is what God has said, I am putting you in charge of moving forward and being a part of this. Are we ready, church? Are we we ready to enter into our community and really be a mouthpiece for the Lord to deliver people who are broken and downtrodden that need a Savior? Are we ready? See, that's the challenge that uh, that Jesus has given us through the book of John. And I hope you understand that. It's a simple message, though. It's very simple. We don't have to create anything new. God has given it to us. It's, a simple, it's as simple as, as Mark 16, 15, going into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. That sounds pretty simple. We, there's nothing we really, more than that that we have to do. Yes, be sensitive to where God leads us, but that is the simplicity of the gospel that we've been called to do. It's a simple message. It changes everything. It changed my life. I remember where I came from, former meth addict and alcoholic, and someone shared with me the same message, and it changed me. And he's changed you, I hope, if you know Christ as your Savior, right? That's what this simple message can do. So David's desire is for Solomon just to be involved, to be involved to help the people that are broken, But he understands the only way he can do that is if we depend upon God. And God's desire, our king's desire is the same for us. The world needs some people to be willing to stand in the gap, be willing to get involved, to move forward, to enter into their community to make a difference. And what we're seeing in Psalm 72, right, is kind of what we see throughout the rest of the scripture. So jump over to John 4. Because what we're seeing here is that Jesus wasn't afraid to get involved. He shows us how to do it, but he also shows us what the outcome is going to be like. And he's providing that need because Jesus is our model. He is the model that we go after in order to know exactly what God has called us to do. So here's what we see happening in John chapter 4. Jesus brought the well of life to a well of death. And let me tell you, the definition of Sikar, the city where they're at, is not death. It's something, far, it's something that leads to a place of death, and you can see it up there. That's the definition of Sikar. See, the city that God led them to is a place of intoxication. John chapter 4, in verse uh, 5, it says, And they come unto the city of Samaria, which is called Sikar, near the parcel of the ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. That word means intoxication, to be drunken. And so, see, Jesus brought the well of life to a well of death. And if you, if you know this story, it's a very simple story. A woman is, is at the well in the heat of the day. She meets Jesus. The disciples are in town buying food. Jesus reveals himself to this woman. She, she believes him. She runs to town, tells everybody about the Messiah. They come. They believe because of his words. You know, um, the believe it are the messages that were given to these kids. We focused, Miss Pam focused on the miracles of Jesus Christ. And that's amazing because it came down, okay, I did this miracle, but what do you believe about me, right? 
Well, here in this story, there were no miracles performed. They believed at his word. You see, that's what it is, just a simple message. And so what we're seeing here is that there are people living in a place of intoxication, right? These people's lives was in a, a difficult place. And intoxication can be more than just alcohol. It can be a person. It can be power. It can be a job. It can be life. You can be overwhelmed or consumed by anything. For me in my life, it was drugs and alcohol. For you, it may have been something else. But it consumed my life. When I woke up for it, I went back after it again. That's what I was looking for. Even in um, uh, Proverbs 23, 35, it says, When shall I wake? I will seek it yet again. It's talking about alcohol in that passage, but it can be anything. Because the world is intoxicated by what it offers and by what the ad adversary leads us to be. And we think it's going to satisfy, but yet we wake up fine again because it never satisfies. That's where Sikar is. That's where they're living right now at a place of intoxication. So it doesn't surprise me. This is where Jesus led the disciples. This is exactly where he led his disciples. Proverbs 27, 20 says, Hell and destruction are never full, so the eyes of man are never satisfied. There's never going to be a time where hell says, Nope, we've got everybody we need. We don't need anybody else. It's not going to happen. And there's not a time that if you have, are in a place of intoxication right now, that on your own, that you're never going to have that draw where it's like, It's enough. My body doesn't need any more. Believe me, it's always going to draw you. So, Something has to change in our life. So Jesus went to this place that was consumed by intoxication. That which makes a person feel alive but for a moment. But once it wears off, you find yourself going back for more. And here's the thing. All you have to do is step into your community and you're going to understand. Yesterday, I was at the store and um, this message was fresh on my mind and I'm at price chopper and I'm buying some items and there was a guy behind me that was buying a big old bottle of alcohol. That's, that's all he had. And I'm not putting him down for this. I'm just helping us to understand because here's a man, I looked at him, he looked broken, he looked downtrodden, his body was wore out, you could tell. But you know what he was doing? He was finding his place at what he knew of what could consume him. This is what doled the pain. This is what in his life brought him to a place to where he could at least handle things for a short period of time. But yet when he wakes, it'll draw him back, right? But see, oftentimes the place of intoxication will be your end. It ends up being a person's end because that's all they ever fight for for their whole life. And so when Jesus brings his disciples to this place, He's going to help them understand that that to intoxication, that drunkenness, whatever it is that draws a person, that keeps a person and will be their demise, there's hope beyond that. And see, we, we're in a community right now that looks perfect, that looks beautiful, but I promise you there are people that are being drawn away by intoxication, and they don't have a way out. But we do, church. We know the way out, and that's exactly what what Jesus is teaching his disciples. And so we're going to look at just four groups of people right here in John chapter 4 because they all had a need. All of them had a need, and this one encounter fulfilled it all. Everybody you come in contact with has a need of something. And some people are trying to use the world and abuse the world to fulfill that need, but it's never going to happen. But Jesus, there's no other name among heaven given among men whereby we can be saved, right? Amen. And so when we look at this, the first one we were seeing is the woman had a need to hear. She was up there by her lonesome in the heat of the day, and she had a problem. Her problem was, was she was living with a man. She had been married five times, but the man she was living with was not her husband. And so what she needed to hear, she needed to hear that there was some hope. Hope is assurance, and the only assurance we have is in Jesus Christ. Look at verses 13 through 15. Here, here, this is the encounter that Jesus had. And it says, Our, um, Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. 
It's always the issue is everlasting life. And the woman said unto him, Sir, give me this water that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. She listened to his words. She responded and said, This is what I want. She was broken inside. And listen to the outcome of this. Look at verse um, 25. The woman said unto him, I know that Messiah cometh, which is called the Christ. When he is come, he will tell us all things. And Jesus reveals himself to her. He says unto her, I that speak unto thee am he. Right then, she recognizes she's just met the Messiah. She runs back. This is when she runs back to tell everybody, I met this prophet. He's told me everything about my life. She just needed a little bit of hope. Sikar, this place, her intoxication of men did not have to be her end. It would have been her end if she had not met the Messiah. She made poor choices just as we all did, but this wasn't the end for her. Sometimes we think, well, that person doesn't, there's no way. But there is a way if they are breathing, there is hope. So the end of a choice can bring a beginning of life. She had to get to the place where not did she allow this intoxication to end her life, but she had to make a decision, I'm done with this, I'm going in and I'm jumping all in with the only hope that I could find. And she met the man by the name of Jesus Christ and it changed her life. You see, we had a simple message to give. That's all Jesus did was give a simple message. But she had a simple decision to make. You know, she, had, she made many arguments to the Lord. The Lord called her on it, showed her the truth. There's going to be a lot of arguments when you go out there and you share the gospel. But ultimately, the Holy Spirit is going to reveal, and her life was changed. All she needed to hear was that there was hope. Are we giving people in our community hope? The second group is the disciples. They needed to see something. They needed to see their calling, that they had a calling. Here in verse 27, Remember, the disciples are out buying food, and when they come back, it says, And upon this came the disciples and marveled that he talked with the woman. Yet no man said, What seekest thou, or why talkest thou to her? She was a Samaritan. And as many of us know, Jews don't work with Samaritans. Samaritans don't get along with Jews. So they're kind of wondering what's going on here. Why is he talking to her? But then Jesus goes in and explains, This is your call. This is why you are here. In verse 31, he says, In the meanwhile, the disciples prayed unto him, saying, Master, eat. But he said unto them, I have a meat to eat that ye know not of. Therefore said the disciples one to another, Hath any man brought him aught to eat? Jesus said unto them, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me, and to finish his work. Say not ye, there are four months, there are yet four months, and then cometh the harvest. Behold, I say unto you, Lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white, all ready to harvest. Right there, we've heard this verse so many times. Our community is white, ready to harvest. People are wanting to know the truth. Like Leo Humphrey used to say, there's more people out there that want to know the truth and there are those willing to take it. And that is so true. And he, he that reapeth receiveth wages and gathereth fruit unto life eternal. And both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together. That's very important. Those who plant, those who water, God wants us to rejoice together in something special that has to do with this kingdom. He says here in verse 37, and herein is this saying true, one soweth, another reapeth. I sent you to reap that whereon ye bestowed no labor. Other men labored and ye are entered into their labors. There's a lot of people who've been plowing the fields in our community that you may never even um, know. But if you just get in to share the message, you might get to reap in that. And we won't know this side of eternity until we get to be with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so there's no difference between Jew and Greek or a Samaritan. And, and that's what he's trying to get his disciples to understand. And, and what this shows us is that we can't pick and choose who gets the gospel. We like to pick and choose. Well, that person won't get saved, or that one person, or I don't really want to. No, we can't pick and choose. We have the message, the message is for all. See, it's a simple labor that we get to enter into. It's a very simple labor. We just enter into it, give a simple message where people can make simple decisions, right? So our responsibility was never to accomplish this alone. It's to accomplish it as a team. Some pray for one another. 
And God does the miracles, right? He does some miraculous things. Others get in and get their hands dirty. Others just give the gospel. That's what VBSE is about. We're all together on that field laboring to give a message that is simple for people to receive. And so if we don't fulfill our calling, it's hard for the family to rejoice. What do I mean by that? We can all rejoice together, and I think right now we can. But if you know God is moving in your heart to be a part of something, a ministry, and he, he's moved your heart to be a part of it, and you said no, the moment it comes time to rejoice, it's going to be difficult for you to rejoice about that. You can rejoice, but that, rejoice won't be, that rejoicing won't be as sweet as if you said yes, because you know that you were involved. So we can't say no to it, and that's where Jesus is with the di disciples. He's saying, get involved, be a part of it. It's ready to go. Don't say no, just say yes unto the Lord, right? So that mo your rejoicing will be more intimate if you say yes unto the Lord. So it's hard to rejoice in the works of others when we're not working ourselves. And God will convict us about that. So the disciples needed to see our calling. Guess what? If you know Christ is your Savior, you should be a disciple of Christ. You should be willing to get out there and be a part of it. And that's what he's trying to show you this morning. But then the third group here is that people need to come, right? And really, that's really up to the Lord. But it's not going to happen unless that message is not shared. Why do they need to come? They need to come in order to believe. Now, we're not going to read 39 through 42. That's where these, this happens. But it's in this story where she runs back and she tells the disciple or tells the people that Jesus told her everything about her life. They come running back, listening to what he has to say. They stay, Jesus stays with them for two days. And then they say, you know what? The reason why we believe him is not because of this woman's testimony and her words. We believe him because of his words, you see? That's very important to know those things because here's the thing. They benefited. The people of Sychar benefited from one person's encounter with Christ. So my question is to you, who is benefiting from your encounter with Jesus Christ? Who's benefiting from that? Uh, who, who's, whose lives are you making a difference? Or are you having or am I having a conversation with a Christ? with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Are people benefiting from our encounter with him? Because these people did. And oftentimes, you share the hope with one person, that person's going to run off and tell others, right? And Jesus Christ says in John 12, 32, And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. That's not our responsibility. That's his responsibility. So you know what this woman did? She runs back to intoxication and she says, Look! A man I met, and she lifted him up, and guess what? He drew all men unto him by giving a simple message. A simple decisions were made. They entered into a, a simple labor, but now you have a, a very simple invitation. In verse 29, you know what she did? She just says this, come and see a man. Come and see a man. That's a very simple invitation. Hey, you know what? We have something taking place on, our, on our, our park out here, our ADP sports park. Well, what's going on? Well, come and see. Just, just come and see. Come and watch what God is doing. Come and see a man. Come and see what's going on. It's a very simple invitation. So if you have an encounter with Christ and then tell others, God promises that he's going to draw them. They have a free will to say no, but that is his promise that he will draw them. So it's a simple invitation. Come and see. So your encounter with Christ is useless if, you, if it's kept to yourself. Now let me give you that in context, what I mean by that. If God is specifically telling you to get involved, to do something, to share a message, but if you're keeping it to yourself, then that message is useless. What's it going to do with anything? You see what I'm saying? Years ago, God showed me this that goes right along with this with uh, what I just said. The message without the mission is useless theology. The message without the mission. You have a message, but if you're not taking it on mission, it's useless theology. But the mission without the message, that's useless activity. If you're out there on mission, but you're not taking the message, then what are we doing? 
They both have to marry. And in order to do so, this has to happen. You have to have an encounter with Christ. And if you're not responding to it, then it becomes a useless encounter in your life. It's very, very important. So people need to come that they might believe. And our last one here is Jesus needs to go. Okay, he needs to go. And, and I like how it says it here in John 4, 4, and he must needs to go through Samaria. Well, what was his need? It was to fulfill the will of the Father. But I love it because the word need here and the way it's phrased is plural. It's plural. It's not just one need. There were more than one needs taking place right here. So why was the word plural? It's because there were more needs than just the one that Jesus had. And we see here in verse 34 what that need was. He says, my meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. John 6, 38 says it this way. For I came down from heaven not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. See, that was the need of Jesus. The need of Jesus was to always fulfill the will of the Father, which should flow over into the church, right? But here's the thing. If he didn't fulfill that need, all the rest of these other needs that we've already talked about would never have happened. Every situation that you are in has many needs. By not going into the community to reach one need, you're actually taking away from many. So if you don't respond to what God is asking you to do, you're taking away from many needs that can be fulfilled out there. You may not know now, but you're going to find out in the future, right? So what it takes, it takes, it takes a simple submission. Just saying yes to God. I, I want to be a part of what our church is doing. I want to be a part of your kingdom. That's what it comes down to. So the further into the gospel, change this one community, okay? Some need to hear that there is hope, and we saw that in the woman. Some need to, to see their calling. We see that in the disciples. Some need to come to Jesus through a spiritual conversation. And I say again, who's coming through your spiritual conversations? And the church needs to do and fulfill the will of the Father to finish his work. That's what we've been called to do. It's a very simple, simple thing. So let me ask you, church, do you have enough faith believing that the gospel can change your community? Do you have enough faith believing that the gospel can change your family, can change your friends, can change your coworkers, can change you, Right? Because the gospel isn't a one-time thing. The Bible says to stand in that gospel because, yes, it saves your soul, but it's a place you live for the rest of your life. Amen? It's eternal. So do you have the faith for that? See, it's a simple message that brings a simple decision that causes you in to enter into a simple labor, but it does take simple submission. The time is now, and let me tell you why as we close out. That passage that we read back in Psalm 72, it has more than the historical what we talked about. That is a millennial passage. That passage is pointing us doctrinally to something that's going to happen in the future. It hasn't happened yet. One of these days, church, if you know Christ is your Savior, we're going to hear the trump. And when that happens, we're going to be taken out of here. And then there's going to be seven years. Seven years of hell on earth why would we want anybody to go through that? But once that is over, we're coming back with Jesus, right? Amen? We're going to come back, and he's going to sit on a throne. And ultimately, Psalm 72, that's what that's talking about, that there's a time where we're going to have a king sitting on a throne. We're going to rule and reign with him for a thousand years on into eternity. It's a beautiful thing. But let me tell you something. There's also what they call the great white throne judgment. And our friends and family and our community that's never heard the name of Jesus, that's never had placed their faith and trust in Christ, they are ultimately going to be cast away from Jesus for all of eternity in a place called hell. And it's a reality. It's what the Bible says. This is one time that we have to further the gospel, no matter what it takes, no matter what we face. This is the one time that we have. Because when we get pulled out of here, we're never going to share the gospel again. We're never going to have an opportunity. So here right now in our church, we have an opportunity to jump out into a place of intoxication in our community and make a difference. And this church is built for you through the spirit of God and the power of God, a place that you get to minister alongside to reach the community that's out there. Praise the Lord for that. And li like I said there at the beginning, 
and throughout. It's very simple. It just takes a decision to get involved. Where will you be involved? And that's the place right now that I want you to take time to talk to the Lord to find out where he would like you to be involved and then just say yes to him in simplicity. Let's go ahead and stand, please. Go ahead and stand. This is the time right now that you can come forward, spend time down here at the altar, spend time at your chair to be able to work this out with God and see people's souls the way that he does. So please take a few minutes to spend some time with your Lord.